I think we're all good. We're already having people log on. This is great. So we have Harmony Smurf and Pekka Hautala and Chris Larson just logged on. So was the Astronomical League uh, happy with the uh, turnout for um, Alcon 2021? Very thrilled. <laughs> Very thrilled. I'll tell you, we all hit it out of the ballpark. You guys That's really true. totally brought your game on. I mean, it was amazing. <laughs> it was. Bar's been set very high. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a good time. Yes, we did. Yeah. It just pulled together extremely well. Thanks to lots of hard work from everybody. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Scott, Terry, uh, um, Chuck, just all of us. You guys had the hardest work to do, really, you know, so. Yeah, but we couldn't have done it without you. That's right. Well, we, well, as our, is most things, you can't do it without each other, so, you it know. It took our village to do it, didn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it, it did. Sure did. Yeah. That was really a very happy meeting, and uh, I will never ever forget Jocelyn's talk. I thought that was that oh, yeah. was absolutely one of the finest talks I've ever been to in my entire life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was amazing. Such an inspiration. Yeah. yeah, definitely. To do what she did was just amazing. Hi, Wendy. I love you. I love you. No, it seems we're just about ready to start. This is the Astronomical League with Terry Mann and Tara yes. Ward and John Goss and Clark live Clark. from Planet Earth. <laughs> Planet Earth. Planet Earth. Planet Earth. Yeah, but who's got the best Southern accent there that I don't have? Where's Terry? Scotty doesn't. He doesn't have a southern accent. No. I used to. Well, I used to, have, I, I used to have a New York accent, but I've been in the Southwest too long. Oh, uh, yeah. Mom had a good southern accent. Well, you sh no, she had New Orleans accent. New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> New Orleans. <laughs> New Orleans. <laughs> Billy.
billions of years ago, Mars was able to have highly explosive volcanism. And it's not just a one-off, but we had many episodes of highly explosive volcanism in a sort of short geologic window. Two folks found these things that look like impact craters in Arabia Terra, but they're missing some features and they have some different features that actually make them look more like volcanic caldera formed from explosions. Jeez. On Earth, we can't actually see this far in the past in many places because we have erosion on Earth. So we don't have access to a great geologic record for three billion years ago on Earth. On Mars, we can see that. We're trying to understand just how large explosions or large lava flows on places like Earth, but also other planets might affect the climate. So we know from just the last century that very large volcanoes do have a climate impact. This tells us something really important about the history of Mars and in turn the history of just planets in the solar system. Well, hello everybody. This is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance, and it's my distinct pleasure to um, introduce everyone here from the, well, I'm not going to introduce everyone, but I will introduce the team from the Astronomical League, uh, who's here for the Astronomical League live program. Uh, their special guest tonight is Claude Plymate. Uh, Claude and, uh, and I have known each other for quite a while. I uh, met him first up at, I think, Big Bear Solar Observatory. And uh, he was working on the uh, big solar telescope there. So it was really amazing. Uh, his experience with adaptive optics will blow your mind. Um, we start off each program with uh, a, an introduction from David Levy. Uh, David has written, if you don't know him, uh, he's written over 20 books on astronomy. Uh, probably hundreds or thousands of articles in magazines about astronomy and has given, I believe, thousands of lectures. Uh, he is a friend to everybody in the astronomical community and one of my best friends. Um, David, I want to turn this over to you. Well, thank you, Scott. And uh, it is really a sincere pleasure to be here. I really enjoyed the lead convention and I wanted to just say that seeing all of you here again, pretty much for the first time since that meeting is really a pleasure. And um, Jocelyn Bell Burnell's keynote lecture is probably one of, probably the best lecture I've ever heard. I really, really enjoyed what, what she had to say. My quotation today is one of my favorites. And I'm sure some of you have been to other meetings or even this one might've heard it before. But this is from Macbeth. And uh, it comes from the time in Macbeth where he has uh, turned to his real darker side and he's been responsible for a ton of murders and he's just killed everyone around him. But somehow he and his wife, Lady Macbeth, have always remained close. But Lady Macbeth went completely nuts and insane and then she dies. <clears throat> and at the end, when a uh, group of people come up to Macbeth and uh, she says, they tell her, they tell Macbeth, the queen, my lord, is dead. And at that point, Macbeth kind of gives up and he decides he's going to die himself. And uh, I'm just imagining Shakespeare sitting at his desk with his windows machine, trying to figure out what to write. Uh, and he... He's, he's probably using Windows that. XP is what he, he was using. using. Windows XP. <laughs> <laughs> Windows XP makes me cough now. Yes. Anyway, yes, he was using Windows XP. And uh, he, uh, he was sitting there trying to figure out, this is something I have to write that's a little bit better than what I'm normally writing. And Shakespeare, Shakespeare knew the power of the pen. But he was sort of sitting there at his desk trying to wonder what to write. And at this point, and I love this to, to tell you this part of the story, there's a tap on his shoulder. He turns around and it's God behind him. 
And God says, Will, take a break, get some coffee, take a walk, get on your bicycle, do something, have some fun. I got this. And uh, anyway, I'm going to read the lines that he says after that. And I'm going to add one line of my own to that because you're wondering, well, this is an astronomical meeting. Why are you quoting from Macbeth? And I think because in this particular passage, Shakespeare is anticipating by three centuries the space time continuum. <clears throat> and he is, um, he is talking about space and time and, uh, and what's happening out there in distant galaxies and uh, how important that is. And he's putting it in a very negative way that in the last two lines, I'm going to try to change a little bit. She should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in its petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time and then is heard no more. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing, signifying everything. Thank you, back to you, Scott. Wonderful, wonderful. Don't you just love that, Terry? I mean, it's just- I do, you know. I do. <laughs> I'm always amazed because he, bring, he brings something different with him. Yes. You know, something that makes you think makes you think about history and back in time. And yeah. and yeah, David, I appreciate so much you being here. Thank you so much, Terry. And I appreciate everything you did for Alcon Virtual. You were an amazing speaker. We had such a good time. So thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Terry. Okay, and next then, I would like to go to Carol Orge. And if you don't know who <laughs> Carol is, Carol is the president of the Astronomical League. Um, not only that, he's a nice guy too. <laughs> so, oh. Carol, how about if you just take it away? Don't spread that around, uh, Terry. I might have to live <laughs> up to something. Secret. I don't want to do that. Uh, David, uh, you really saved the day. That last line really was great. It was all great, but you promised that you were going to add a little bit there, and it, it really fit in nicely. I'd like to give a report from the uh, Alcon. Uh, we haven't had a meeting uh, uh, online here since. So it was most successful. Who would have thought we would have had an online virtual convention that had 600 plus registered from across the world? And who would have thought also that we would have had uh, our keynote speaker from across that great pond called the ocean in England? It was outstanding. It's been alluded to already. And also, We've had nothing but favorable comments from all the great talks because it was something for everyone there, something for everyone. And who would have also thought when we put out the offer maybe eight months ago, actually a little less than that, to our individual clubs, asking they'd like to participate and showcase their clubs as well as present uh, door prizes. And the response was overwhelming. And it's such a good feeling. And of course, uh, Terry and Chuck leading the effort. And of course, behind all that, the technology, there was Scott with Explore Scientific's expertise on all the various um, media platforms. And it was just a great situation. I don't know how we're going to do an encore. Uh, and I forgot John. John, uh, as our media director, uh, helped put together our, uh, our various media for uh, before this event. Uh, for an encore, we're going to Albuquerque next year, 2022, after uh, those uh, members being extremely patient for two years and saying, we'll wait another year. And then this past year, this says, well, I guess we'll wait another year to do it in person. So we're very thankful for that. I don't think we uh, will see the same type of Alcon we've previously had when we had in-person conventions because 
this virtual environment has so many unlimited possibilities and we've got to uh, uh, add to that. Uh, for people who cannot attend the convention, I think we need to offer the opportunity there for all of our members to be able to participate in some way and uh, at some level, whether it's live or taped or however we figure that out. So I'm very thankful for that. So we've all had nothing but good news about all that. And uh, in addition to that, down the road, uh, we are now actively in uh, discussions with the Baton Rouge Astronomical Society. Uh, we'll be setting up some meetings in the next week or two to solidify that. But we haven't been in Louisiana for a long time, so I'm looking forward to that one in 2024. I'm sorry, 2023. Then in 2024, we are truly going to have a, I guess we would say a second international convention because this one we just had was international with uh, our speakers. But in 2024, the plans are to go to Toronto and have a joint meeting with uh, RESC. So we're really looking forward to that. And finally, uh, the following year, we're going to go back to Bryce Canyon. And uh, Terry uh, and uh, Lowell uh, had that up uh, back in 2011. And it was an extremely successful mm -hmm. convention in very dark skies. And we've had nothing but raves about what a wonderful location that is. We're looking forward to it. And uh, I've already discussed with uh, uh, Lowell, making sure we have a good, strong signal there, even if they have to bring it in <laughs> in the, the park there, so we can reach people around the world like we did for this uh, last convention. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Terry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. You know, it's so nice to hear about all of the Alcons that are coming up because, you know, I always want to know where I'm going <laughs> because I usually make plans early. When I go someplace like that, I usually stay. I either go early and visit the area or I stay after and, you know, travel around some since I'm already out there and I have time to kind of settle into where we're at. So it's really nice to know where we're going. I've, you know, I've never been to Louisiana, so Baton Rouge will probably be a shock to me because I've simply never been there before. So I'll have a lot to look at. But um, thank you for everything, all the compliments and all the comments. And yeah, I think from now on, somehow we're going to have to figure out how to do the virtual end of it. Um, if it's like a limited, you know, or what sessions we can do or however, I think we'll all be kind of giving that some thought. And in Albuquerque, we'll, we'll probably plan on having a virtual component as long as we can drag Scott there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just need yeah. uh, more help. That's all I need. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll get all the help I need from the astronomical. <laughs> link, so. Yeah, I understand that. So, all right. Well, thanks again, Carol. Um, and so now I would like to go to John Goss. As Carol was saying, he is our media director mm -hmm. and he has helped with Alcon virtual, well, everything, anything we want to do for announcements, uh, you know, conferences, anything. John's a go-to guy. We say, okay, this is what I need. And can you do this? So it's like Carol said, it's a village. It really takes all of us sometimes to do all of the things that we do. So John, if you would just go right ahead. Okay, great. Yeah, th thank you, Terry. I don't, I don't know if, how much of that was deserved or not, but I appreciate your, your comments. So we're talking about Louisiana. Well, um, most people don't realize that that is the state in which I first entered this world uh, quite some time ago on a very sultry July day. But that was then and here we are today. It'd be nice going, going back and seeing, seeing the area again. Um, yeah, I'd like to, like to say a few words. I have a slideshow in, in just, just a moment. Um, and I, I'll start out by, by, by telling people a little bit about our observing programs. Well, I'm not going to say a whole lot because we have so many observing programs, it would really take, take you a half hour to cover them all and to say something meaningful about each one. But one of them, and well, there's three of them in particular I, I want to cover, cover tonight. Um, amateur astronomers normally start out in the hobby by looking at the moon. And they look at the craters and mountains and so on, and then they move on to the planets and deep sky objects and such. 
Sometimes, though, they return to the moon and try to look at it a little, little bit closer. So the league has offered offers three programs to enhance your lunar observing, uh, starting from the very beginning on how to find uh, certain craters or mountains and and other things, uh, Mare on the moon, uh, to doing some various activities such as watching uh, lunar eclipses, uh, lunar occultations, things of that nature, and. They have a new program. Well, it's not really new. It's, it's been around for a few years, but it's called the Lunar Evolution Program, which kind of ties it all together. So I, I'd like to talk a little bit about this. Um, and I'm going to start my screen share, I hope, sometime. <laughs> Sorry about this. There we go. Excellent. Before I start talking about the moon's moon, the moon, I'll just share with you a question. And we're not going to answer it right, right now, a little bit later on. Why has it been said that the moon is made of green cheese? You know, we've heard this all the time. And you're still thinking, what? You know, what does that mean? Obviously, the moon's not made of green cheese. So how, how, how did this come about? Well, we'll, we'll discuss that here in, in just a few minutes. We have a new manual, lunar manual coming out shortly, real shortly. It's, it's still in the process of being slapped together, but it's, near, it's nearly done. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that and why uh, um, these observing programs are really, really good thing to have. Um, telephone. <laughs> Yes. Uh, here's the table of contents, and I'm not going to go through it all. The, the manual now is, is about 60 pages or so. It may, may hit 70 pages. But there's uh, a couple of things I'd like to point out about the moon and how, it, how this manual uh, kind of ties all the programs together. We have three programs. We have the Lunar Program, the Lunar 2 Program, and the Lunar Evolution. So one thing I'd like to talk about is how to determine elevation heights on, on the moon. Okay, th there you are with your amateur telescope, what, 100 power, 150 power, looking at the moon. Looks pretty good. You know, you, you look at the Terminator, you see a lot of shadows, mm -hmm. you see some rough areas, some plains, some craters and so on. And you start wondering, well, how high are those mountains? You know, how, how high are those cr crater walls? You could- hey, John, uh, yes. John, can I interrupt? Sure can. Um, the picture we're seeing is elevation. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. You're, you're jumping. You're jumping ahead of me there. I. <laughs> I did, my, you said you see craters, and I don't see craters. <laughs> well, you're not going to see craters on this picture. That's uh, right. So there, okay. Just wanted to make sure. So, so you look at the craters and you wonder how to determine their elevation of, of the walls. Now the process. Sounds pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Just you take some of your high school trigonometry, measuring the the, the shadow length of, of, of the feature and the sun angle, and you can figure out with trigonometry the, the, the feature height. That's easy to do. However, obtaining the shadow length um, and the sun's angle, it not quite 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 so simple. The real problem that you're facing is that you're not dealing with a disc, you're dealing with a sphere. And well, you're, you're dealing with a sphere that appears to be projected onto a disc, so your angles aren't quite right. They're always off a little bit. Um, the angular distance out from the center of the lunar disc extends pretty, pretty far out there, of 45 degrees, extends, extends pretty far out, out to the edge. And that's important, and I'll describe that and why so in just a moment. Your real problem is uh, the determining where something is on the face of the moon, simply because of the phenomenon called lunar libration. And I really don't want to discuss this because this would be a whole lecture in itself, but the moon wobbles back and forth and nods up and down every month, uh, which means that there are certain uh, features, well, the features on the moon don't always occupy the same position uh, when you're looking at it straight on. Such as, let's look at the, the, the crater Tycho, which is very easy object to see on the moon. Uh, depending on what type of vibration you have, 
Tycho could shift downwards or upwards a little bit or over to the left or to the west or to, to the east. Now, obviously the crater isn't moving, but it's the moon that's wobbling back and forth that's, that's, that's causing this effect. That causes a problem in that you're unable to, to um, clearly ascertain the angle of the sun in the sky because it could be shifted a few degrees one way or the other, and that would affect your, your solar angle. So now we're going to start talking about craters, Terry. There you go. Okay, this is my rather lame shot of the moon. I took this back in January. And this is uh, the northern part of the moon. You can see the uh, mountain kind of in the, up, up in the upper left side, uh, uh, Mons Piton. Uh, it's a nice lunar mountain rising out of the uh, Imbrium, Amare Imbrium plain. The larger crater you see is uh, Aristillus. The, the, the crater to the upper left that has a, another central crater in it is Cassini, and the smaller one is Cassini A. This is a, a really nice area to look at in the moon because you get some nice deep dark shadows, long shadows. So here I am identifying what, what we're looking at. Um, going through some, some of this, what you have, you have a process of figuring out, well, one way of doing this so fairly easily is objects near the terminator are pretty easy to find as far as the length of the shadows. Uh, the one problem is you're gonna be having is determining exactly where the terminator is. You're gonna to have to do some guesswork because it's not a, a sharp line. I drew it in, at least what I thought it was. Let's, let's look at um, Mon, Mons Piton. Um, you can, well, no, let's don't. Let's, let's go over to Cassini, the, the, the crater. Um, you can look that up and you can find out that it's 57 kilometers in diameter. Okay. So we can take a, a proportional units from that and you can look at Mons Piton and figure out how far it is from the Terminator. And when, when you do that, you're gonna find out it's on this scale here, it's about 50, or excuse me, about um, 80, 80 kilometers from, from the Terminator. Because you know that distance, uh, you can figure out the sun angle uh, from Mons Piton if it says, if it's 80 kilometers from the lunar terminator. Uh, and you figured out that it's 3.9 degrees, the solar angle. So now you, you know the sun's angle in that, back in, the, in that formula, in that very basic trigonometry formula. Then you look at the shadow and you measure those, those proportional units and how long that shadow is. If it's 80 kilometers from, from Piton to the terminator, well, the shadow is going to be about 35.3 kilometers. Now, the, you're going to have some inaccuracy there because the shadow has a, uh, a penumbra part to it in which the sun doesn't fully shine um, um, on, on the surface. Part of it's blocked by the mountain, part of it's not. So you have a, a penum penumbral shadow, which is kind of, it makes it a little, little, little bit fuzzier. Anyway, you throw that all in and you get some uh, units and some heights that you can find from, from, from Mons Piton. Um, let's uh, expect the next shot. Yeah, okay. So when, when you do, uh, oh, this is his Pico, it's really Piton. Um, when, when you do the, the calculations, you find out that it's about 17 kilometers wide and it's about 2.4 kilometers high. The published value is uh, 2.3 uh, kilometers high. So you're, you're, you're doing pretty darn, darn close. So there you are, your earthly perch from 24,000 miles away with your small telescope, you, you're able to, to determine this mountain height fairly well. If you're careful and uh, make, make some uh, valid assumptions, you can come up with a, a pretty good pretty good representation. Now, the bottom picture is the uh, Apollo 15 shot from orbit of, of that same area. And you can see it kind of looks like it. So, you know, here you are from 24,000 miles away, you're able to determine something like that. You get to uh, get a nice cross-sectional profile. Now, let's, let's go back and look at the crater Aristillus how wide it is, figuring out how wide it is, how deep it is, how, um, how high the uh, walls are from the surrounding plane and how the ramparts are, that is the surrounding skirt around the, around the crater, how, how wide that is. Again, uh, you can look this up. You can, uh, any source will tell you that uh, Aristillus is about 55 kilometers in diameter. And by this proportional distances from that, you can find out that it's really about 100, in this picture, it's about 132 kilometers uh, from the Terminator. 
throwing all, the, all that in, into trigonometry, you're gonna find out that it's a little over five degrees sun elevation. Again, plugging all these back into your formula of, of uh, solar angle and shadow length, you can find out that, uh, that the, um, what can you find out? The, the, shadow, the central shadow is, is about uh, 28 kilometers wide. Okay, that big deal. But the shadow, uh, the wall shadow is only about 10 kilometers wide. And that all works out to being able to figure out your, again, your, your height, height profile of the, uh, of the crater, the shadow and its depth. And you're gonna end up with something like this. That the, the, the crater, you looked it up and found it was 55 kilometers. But from your measurements of the shadows, you were able to figure out that it's about 3.8 kilometers deep. The published value is about 3.6. So you're pretty, pretty close to there. The walls aren't extremely high above the plane, but they're still about uh, 0.9 kilometers. Um, so, you know, there is, it, it does have a wall, but it is a pretty deep crater. Uh, and this is a pretty typical crater. Uh, at least it's cross-sectional profile is. And I'll show you here. Oops, out of order here. Let's go to a uh, profile of Copernicus. Um, you can see that the surface of, uh, of the moon on here, is the curvature of the surface and an actual scale model of, of Copernicus across it. And it, Copernicus is, is about 58 miles wide, which is about 80 or 90, 90 93 kilometers across. But Aristillus, what we just looked at is 55 across. So it's a little bit smaller, but you can see the same general shape is there. I think this is pretty fascinating because again, here you are sitting on your perch from 240,000 miles away and you're able, an amateur with, uh, hey, I don't have any, any big equipment here, you know, with pretty basic equipment, uh, can find the, uh, calculate the cross-sectional profiles of many of these objects and come fairly close to how, how they really are. Excuse me. The um, Lunar Evolution Program of, of the League kind of ties this all together on how these, why the craters look like the way they do, how big they are, uh, how high the, the uh, crater walls are, how steep they are, if it has a central peak or whatnot. And you'll have a series of craters and, and other features to look at to help you, to help illustrate this. And so you understand a little bit better of what happened. Now for the, for the crater uh, formation, we're not gonna go into a whole, whole lot of this, but as you can imagine you've got your incoming impactor, which would be a, a small meteoroid. It could be a, a, a mile or two or three, depending on, on the object, smacking into the surface, excavating it within just a second, two seconds or three seconds, and everything is thrown out. And you have a wall built up with a lot of sl backsliding of material sliding back down the wall, filling a lot of it in. So you get a flat crater bottom. The central uh, impact or the, the, the shock of the impact force the uh, compression of the moon, which bounces back up and you have a central crater. So from that, here we are, what, 3.64 billion years later from our perch, looking at this, trying to determine the actual size and depth of the crater and height of the walls and so on. And we, we can do it, we, we can do it. Just looked at that one. So the Lunar Evolution Program, as I was just saying, tie, ties it all together. Um, anyone who looks at the moon will, will see uh, Mari em Embryo. It's, it's a really attractive portion of the moon with a lot of different features. In fact, that on the uh, right side of that uh, Mari is what we were looking at earlier in these past, past few slides. But uh, you can put all your observations together with all these other craters and all the mountain ranges and figure out how this thing was made and uh, have a better understanding of the moon. Then you, you turn into in trying to figure out, well, how, how did we get all of this information? Well, we have the uh, six Apollo missions, which were essentially uh, sample return missions, bringing back the, the rocks, the lunar soil, the, uh, the, 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 um, the, the brushes, the a regolith, um, all that stuff. And scientists were able to analyze to figure out how it was formed and, and how old it is through the uh, radioisotope dating of a lot of these, these rocks. So that, that, that was pretty, pretty, pretty important there. But this uh, lunar manual that we're gonna have coming out will explain all this, tie it all together, 
and it'll make your experience under the telescope that much more rewarding. Uh, you'll learn a lot, and I think you'll, you'll have a lot of fun. It's, I went through some, some math on this, but it's, it's not, there's not, not a lot in there. It, if you have some very basic high school trigonometry, I stayed away from uh, spherical geometry, which can get pretty complicated with sines and cosines pretty fast. So it's a, it's, it, it's a good indication or it's, it's a good guide to help you understand the moon and how, how, to, how to observe it. Okay. The green cheese. Well, the, the correct answer, I'll give you the correct answer before I give you my answer. <laughs> the correct answer is that no one really knows. Uh, <laughs> one plausible, my answer is one plausible explanation is that the green isn't referring to color at all, uh, but to the uncured state of, of recently formed cheese is green. And if you look at a cheese wheel <clears throat> uh, that is un, un, completely, not completely cured, still in the screen state, it does like the surface of the moon as it's seen in a rippling pond. So the moon's made of green cheese. Kind of fanciful, but I think this explains it fairly well. But as I said, no, no one really knows. So you go ahead and make, make up your own explanation. Anyway, um, so I hope you have a good time looking at, at the moon, trying to understand it. Do some of these programs, the lunar programs that the league offers. Um, once you're done with that, go on to some of these other programs too. We have a lot of them out there and it's, they're meant to, to help us all enjoy the sky and understand it a little bit better. So on that happy note, thank you. Thank you, John. We're gonna make you the moon man of the Astronomical League. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm not really known for observing the moon except for the past year or so. And yeah, you know, yeah. Something new. You, have up, something new. <laughs> you have came up with some of the best outreach. I love the outreach where you showed how to use the beach ball and paint that. I mean, that is, a, I, it's sim but it's simple. I mean, it's something anybody would have access to, to do. And it is an amazing outreach program. I mean, something to do for outreach that it's it looked different. great. Thank you. It's different. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely different, but I, I liked it. So thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, we'll be watching for that new manual. That'll be fantastic. So, all right. What I am going to do now, um, as you know, we always ask three questions on uh, Astronomical League Live. So I am going to, uh-oh, there it is, share my screen and bring up the questions. And let's see what we've got this week, or this month, rather. Um, and as everybody's been talking about, we were all amazed uh, with Alcon 21 virtual. It, thank you all for watching. We had such a tremendous crowd out there. We had currently 22,000 views of Alcon virtual. Um, and thanks to the people and the clubs that donated the door prizes, and it was so great to hear about your clubs. It always helps because I was just reading our annual report and I chair the Great Lakes region and we have got an additional 325 members in the Great Lakes region in the last year. And to me, that's amazing. You know, people are really looking to the sky to see what's going on. And not only that, it'll help us maybe to try to find a little bit of help, help getting rid of light pollution because that's another thing that I think all amateur astronomers, professional, many of us are concerned about for very many reasons. But uh, thank you to the clubs, to the people, and to all of you. We had such a great time. Uh, and we're looking forward to bringing this along to all of our conferences, all of our Alcons. So stay tuned. You'll hear more about that as we move along. So tonight's door prize will be a cap. It's going to be an astronomical league cap. There'll be one for each of the three winners. So please, as I ask the questions, this time uh, we need to answer them quickly. It's not like the global star party where you can answer them slowly. Uh, I will announce the winners after Claude gets done with his talk. And please send the answers to secretary at astroleague.org. And do it as quickly as you can, because it will take me a little while to decide 
uh, the winner. And doing that, I will use a number generator, and that's how I will do that. Um, and a representative of the league will contact the winner. So look forward to hearing from somebody from the league if your name is announced. So this is Astronomical League Live, and here is the first question. If you do not have a go-to telescope, name another way of finding objects in the sky. And again, answers to secretary at astroleague.org. I have to receive them today, very shortly. Second question, what is the name of this object? And the last question, what observatory houses the largest refracting telescope ever built for astronomical research? And again, please send your answers to secretary at astroleague.org. And with that, what I am going to do, Claude, would you be ready to go on a little bit early tonight? Uh, sure, let me... Okay. Uh, let's see, share my screen there, start this. Oh, Cla let me introduce you first before you start. I'm sorry, I just about went right by. Uh, I don't know for those I of you who do not know Claude, let me tell you a little bit about him. Claude Plymate is now retired from a career spanning 35 years in the field of solar astronomy. Claude spent 26 years with the National Solar Observatory, NSO, in various capacities, including engineering physicist and site manager for the McMath Pierce Solar Telescope at Kitt Peak, Arizona. Claude left NSO in 2011 to take a position of telescope engineer and chief observer for the Big Bear Solar Observatories, 1.6 meter. Goody Solar Telescope. Since retiring at the start of 2021, he and his wife, Teresa, have relocated to the Tach Tachahaki, I mean, I'm sorry. Tachapi. Thank you, I'm not from the area, <laughs> California, uh, where they plan to continue to pursue their shared passion for astronomy as amateurs. Claude holds a bachelor's degree in physics astronomy and a master's in astronomy. His master's research focused on infrared uh, spectrography of temperature of minimum, temperature minimum region just above the solar photosphere. Results from his thesis, above limb imaging of the 4.7 micron fundamental rotation vibration CO lines were presented at the 2004 meeting of the American Astronomical Society. Over the years, Claude has had the privilege of working with and development of various astronomical instruments, including the NSO, Kit Peak Fourier Transform Spectrometer, Adaptive Optics for both solar and planetary use, Infrared Dual Beam Spectropolarimeter, and Lunar Coronagraphic Telescope for mapping the moon's sodium exosphere. His work was recognized by being awarded the Association of Universities for Research in Astronomy, ORA, Innovation and Technology Award, Award in 2001. Claude, it is a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for speaking tonight. Well, thank you for that. Uh... Very nice introduction, uh, Blush. Uh, anyway, through my career, I've been uh, very privileged to witness firsthand how the digital computer revolution that we're really still living through has transformed every aspect of astronomy. One of these dramatically transformative technologies is adaptive optics. Adaptive optics, or just AO, has made ground-based astronomy competitive with uh, space-borne telescopes and has enabled the current generation and well, future generation of giant telescopes to fully utilize 
the resolution that their size allows. Now, I don't expect by the end of this hour, you'll walk away as a fully qualified AO design engineer, but I do hope that um, I might be able to give you a fair, fairly good intuitive grasp of what adaptive optics is, how it actually works, and also its um, limitations. I also will try to dispel some of the misconceptions around the, uh, around the concept. Well, we have a lot of territory to cover, so let's get at it. Um, starting my clock to try to keep myself honest here, moving ahead. There are basically three things I want you to remember during this talk. One, aperture equates to resolution. Now, um, that's shown nicely in the uh, Rayleigh criterion here, the, the, uh, the minimum angle you can resolve on the sky is approximately proportional to the wavelength that you're using over the diameter of your optical system. Now, um, this is an approximation, but uh, the very, very small angles we're going to be talking about for astronomical use, it's a very, very good approximation. So from here on in, this I'm going to be talking about equates to. And um, so the what do we mean by resolving power for the resolution of a telescope? That is the angle on the sky that you can just distinguish with your optical system. So um, a very small angle, if you can resolve a very fine angle, that's what we call high resolution. And um, if it's a large angle, it's the finest thing you can resolve, that's fairly low resolution. And so small telescopes have fairly low resolution, large telescopes, large resolution. And um, so resolution uh, is proportional to both the wavelength you're using and inversely proportional to the aperture of your telescope. Um, tonight, we're going to be assuming that we're talking about uh, optical wavelengths. So everything I talk about and everything I'll be talking about, these numbers are going to be approximations. So don't hold me too closely to uh, saying 250 millimeters is 10 inches. Yeah, it's close enough. We're astronomers. And um, when I talk about the middle of the visible, which I'll be using through here, most people would call that 5550 uh, nanometers. Just for convenience, I'm going to call the middle of the visible 500 nanometers. It's my talk, so get used to it. So, um, so let's move on. The second thing I want you to remember is that um, any optical aberration that is known can be corrected with additional optics. Now, anybody that has to wear glasses to see clearly knows that intimately. But the poster child for that is really the Hubble Space Telescope here. Um, it was finally launched in, what, 1990, I think it was. The front aperture opened, and oh my god, it had spherical aberration. Um, optical engineers carefully analyzed what that aberration was. They designed and built some uh, corrective optics for it, and for a delivery fee of a mere quarter billion dollars. They took it up, installed it, and uh, from then on, the telescope, if anything, exceeded all expectations and continues to do so. The third thing to remember is a real image produced in an optical system can be manipulated as if it's the actual real object. In other words, we can magnify it, demagnify it, we can distort it, whatever. So we can work on the real image as if it's the actual object. So what is the problem we're trying to deal with tonight? Well, our atmosphere limits the resolution available at the Earth's surface, what we call astronomical scene. Um, and that's caused by changes in air temperature changes its refractive index. That's illustrated nicely in this uh, picture of the moon. 
that is nice and sharp. However, with this uh, airliner, I think it's an MV-80, flying across the front of it, you'll note that the uh, hot exhaust from the jets coming out is distorts the image. Now, that's not due just to turbulence. It is due to the temperature difference coming out of those jets. If it were just turbulence, well, the wingtips produce turbulence, the body, all that sort of thing, and that does not. So what we're really worried about is temperature difference. Turbulence, if it's the same temperature, will not alter our image. Now, bubbles of air at differing temperatures act like weak lenses to deviate rays as they randomly move through our field of view. Um, so essentially perfect wavefronts coming from what, light minutes away, light hours away, light years away, billions of light years away, arrive perfectly, essentially perfectly flat. And in the last third of a millisecond, or the last 100 kilometers as it uh, comes through the atmosphere, our atmosphere, it gets distorted in some arbitrary random way. And keep in mind that that random uh, aberration is changing moment by moment. And that's what we see, of course, again, is astronomical scene, the twinkle of starlight, et cetera. Now, these distortions in the atmosphere can happen anywhere from the very top of the atmosphere, up the top of the, uh, the jet stream, all the way down to right in front of your telescope to even inside your telescope. Uh, I use this photograph to illustrate that. And you can see that uh, this is the sun rising over the uh, a ridge in Big Bear. Uh, you can see the sun is highly distorted, but notice the, uh, the trees and the ridge in the foreground are fairly sharp. So in this case, the scene, the distortion was caused by the top, something high up in the atmosphere. So, this astronomical scene limits the resolving power at even the best sites on your surface to, I don't know, half an arc second. Um, sure, you'll occasionally hear some people brag, lie about uh, their quarter arc second scene, whatever. It doesn't matter for, for, the case, for what we're describing here. Um, this, the atmosphere becomes the real limit to our resolving power here at the Earth's surface. And if we assume a half arc second scene, which is a very, very good scene, that still equates to, again, if we talk about the middle of the visible, a, resolve, a resolution of a optical system of about 250 millimeters, 10 inch aperture. And in telescopes, of course, size matters. The larger your telescope, the fainter the objects you can see. But uh, what we're concerned with this evening is the resolving power. Again, the Rayleigh criterion there, um, the minimum angle you can resolve equals 1.22 times lambda over d. And in this case, uh, lambdas and radians, wavelength and aperture are just in the same units, whatever that is. Now, um, if you're interested in something like degrees or arc seconds, you need to convert that. But again, this shows you that uh, that resolving power is directly proportional to wavelength, inversely proportional to aperture. So the larger your telescope, the better your resolving power. And if I plot this, is a arc second resolution is a function of aperture in meters. Not surprisingly, as you get the larger and larger aperture, you're seeing or your resolving power gets better and better. One arc second scene, which is pretty darn good, can be resolved by an eighth of a meter. That's about a five inch telescope. Half arc second requires a uh, quarter meter, 10 inch telescope, and on up, et cetera, et cetera. Now, 
let's assume that our seam limits us to a half arc second. So any aperture above that 10 inches is limited not by the diffraction limit of your optical system, but by the atmosphere above your telescope. Um, this, of course, applies to long exposures. And yes, there are ways to occasionally beat that with uh, extremely fast, lucky imaging or speckle, speckle interferometry, things like that. But the basic concept holds. So uh, to badly paraphrase Jody Foster, anything greater than about 10 inches is just a waste of resolving power. Right here, where those two lines cross, where your aperture just critically samples the seeing limit, is an important concept in adaptive optics, something we'll be returning to numerous times. This is called the seeing scale, or R0. Occasionally, you'll hear it called the fried parameter. But uh, this is the aperture where you are just sampling the scene. Anything larger, you are scene limited. Smaller, you're diffraction limited. So this can be a way of thinking of your scene, not in the uh, angle that you can resolve, but in the effective aperture that will give you that scene limit. Keep that in mind as we go along. It can also be thought of as the um, angle on the sky over which the uh, the wave front coming in is effectively flat for your uh, resolving power. Um, when limited by seeing, the sensitivity we all know of your of your telescope goes up as the collecting surface, the area of your collecting surface, or the aperture squared. In other words, doubling your aperture, you get four times the uh, the uh, sensitivity. But if you are diffraction limited on point sources up in this regime where you're beyond this, you uh, continue to be um, diffraction limited and you double your aperture, you are, your sensitivity goes up as the aperture to the fourth power, not squared. In other words, if you double your aperture, your sensitivity goes up by a factor of 16. Why is that? Well, when you're seeing limits the resolution, your stellar image, your point source, is, is limited to a set enclosed area. Double your aperture, and sure, you have four times as much light, but it is still limited to that uh, seeing disk, that same size. So yes, it's four times brighter. But if you can maintain the fraction limit, even into as you double your aperture, the area over which that uh, energy is contained in your field of view is half the diameter, one, uh, one quarter the area, giving you another factor of four. So instead of uh, quadrupling your image intensity, it actually it goes up by a factor of 16. This starts to give you an idea of some of the motivation to try to maintain that diffraction limit beyond what our atmosphere will tend to deliver for us. Now, when I was an undergraduate, there was a truism that the only way to beat the atmosphere was to launch your telescope into space. Of course, space telescopes have effectively perfect seeing, but is exceedingly expensive. Um, my rule of thumb is uh, space telescopes are about three orders of magnitude, the cost of a earth born telescope making, say, uh, your, your run-of-the-mill university million-dollar telescope, you want that in orbit, that'll cost you a billion dollars suddenly. So that's not really practical for most budgets. The other option became adaptive optics. 
Adaptive optics was conceived in 1953 by Forrest Babcock out here in California at the Mount Wilson Observatory. And uh, here's the paper presented at that time on the concept. However, it was just impractical to try to implement before uh, the availability of high speed computers. Uh, unbeknownst to the astronomical community, or at least most of us, um, starting sometime in the late 70s and through the 80s, the DOD did develop adaptive optics in secret. And then fortunately, uh, the astronomers working for the DOD had, um, lobbied and got permission to at least partially declassify the uh, technology in the early 90s, such that it could be developed for astronomy. What is adaptive optics? It is a technique for high-speed correction of optical aberrations caused by our atmosphere. Now, the first misconception I want to make sure we clarify here is the idea of to differentiate active optics from adaptive optics. While they are conceptually very similar, they are meant to correct very different issues and work in very different time regimes. Adaptive optics has to correct very, very quickly for changes in the atmosphere, something like uh, thousands of times per second, where active optics are meant to correct wavefront aberrations caused by near flexure or um, flexures in the um, telescope structure itself as it slowly moves across the sky. So this correction period can be seconds, even minutes. Um, because of the great mass, the inertia of a primary mirror, it's impractical to try to move that mirror fast enough to keep up with the atmosphere. So um, typically, adaptive optics will use a very small mirror that is extremely thin and can be moved very quickly, as I said, on the order of kilohertz. Where uh, active optics, the actuators can work on the primary mirror itself to keep it in a proper parabolic or whatever shape as it moves across the sky. And um, here is the active optics network on the backside of the mirror cell for the three and a half meter wind telescope out at Kip Peak. Now here is a cartoon of a typical adaptive optics system. What we have is that perfectly flat wavefront coming in from some astronomical distance, coming through an aberrating medium, in our case, typically the atmosphere. And implied in this is there will be a telescope somewhere in this area. But um, through that atmosphere, that flat wavefront becomes distorted in some random fashion. It then, in a collimated beam, is reflected off of a deformable mirror. It takes on just the correct shape to cancel that uh, wavefront distortion as best as possible, and uh, which reachieves the diffraction limit of that telescope if properly designed. That uh, flat wavefront is sent through some re-imaging optics back to the uh, camera or science instrument, whatever is being used, and has a very good image. Uh, at the same time, some bit of that beam is kicked off either by a beam splitter or uh, more efficiently, maybe a dichroic uh, filter that will use wavelengths not being used by the science camera, sent off to a magic box called a wavefront sensor, then a computer analyzes that, um, sends signals to the amplifiers that uh, move the deformable mirror to take out any residual wavefront aberration from the latest correction or the latest measurement. Now, the trick of this is this closed servo loop has to go fast enough to keep up with and um, any changes before the sky has a chance to make them. And that is the trick. 
Now, a special note, AI doesn't really know nor care where these aberrations arise. Um, and think about it, if the Hubble telescope had adaptive optics or even active optics, there never would have been a problem. They would have corrected, we never would have, would have even heard about the problem. So let's first of all talk about the deformable mirror. Now, there are several types of uh, ranging in size. Um, typically, it's a relatively small and very flexible optical surface, often made out of glass, sometimes referred to as a rubber mirror. Now, behind the, uh, the flexible mirror is a matrix of actuators that uh, push and pull and or pull on that uh, mirror surface to deform the mirror to any arbitrary um, shape we desire. Typical actuators can be piezoelectric pistons or electrostatic um, or voice coil solenoids. Down on the left, we see a uh, fairly common commercial option. This is from a company called Zenetics. It's a roughly 100 millimeter diameter uh, flat mirror with uh, 349 piezo actuators on the back, which can react in milliseconds or even faster to take out that wavefront aberration. On the right, here is a very large, it's, I don't know, it's uh, something on the order of a meter. It is actually the secondary mirror for the large binocular telescope out there in Arizona. And it has 600, 672 voice coil actuators on the back of that. And of course, there are two of those, one for each mirror, for your sister reminding me. Uh, there can even be extremely small, low cost adaptive mirrors. Here is a uh, broken example of a uh, small membrane mirror from a company called Flexible Optics in the Netherlands. Uh, normally, if it wasn't broken by somebody, they would have a, a silicon nitrite uh, membrane reflective surface over the front uh, that is at a, a ground potential. Then there are uh, 30, 37 electrostatic sites on the back that the voltage can be changed, uh, a few hundred volts, that will then tug on that membrane. Think about a uh, trampoline with a bunch of people on the back that have handles and somebody yelling at each person. How, how much to tug on that. You can imagine how that actually functions. Now, recall that any arbitrary wavefront distortion can be corrected with additional optics. An image of the telescope pupil, consider that basically the primary mirror, uh, is formed on the deformable mirror. So changes to that, uh, to the, the formal mirror is equivalent to changing the shape of the primary mirror itself. And a mirror with uh, the same curvature but half the amplitude will reflatten the uh, wavefront and correct the image distortion. A common misconception is that what you really have to do is use the opposite curvature to cancel that wavefront. Um, and I come up with a little illustration here that I hope will uh, convince you of the truth of what I just said. So uh, physicists love to come up with overly simplified uh, models of a system to uh, illustrate it, what would otherwise be a complex system. This leads to the old joke that probably most of you have heard that uh, a physicist was asked uh, to model some characteristic of a herd of cows. The physicists came back and uh, to make their calculation simple, started off by modeling the cows as simple spheres. So you might say, this is my spherical cow. Um, so here we have a, a grossly simplified um, cartoon of a grossly exaggerated distorted wavefront. And it's propagating down towards a flat mirror. Let's see what happens. 
As the wavefront strikes, and here, of course, the lowest part of that uh, wavefront strikes the optical surface, come reflects back up as the next part hits and comes back up. And what we are left with, not surprisingly, is exactly the same wavefront distortion we had when we started, just inverted, say, mirror image. Now, um, let's see what happens when we use a deformable mirror that takes on the opposite shape to quote unquote cancel that wave from distortion. Here we again have that same uh, cartoon of a grossly simplified, exaggerated, distorted wavefront coming down. But this time we have a uh, deformable mirror, the wavefront sensor senses what the distortion of that uh, wavefront is, sends that information off to the deformable mirror, and watch what happens when it reflects off this, this mirror surface. The lowest part of the wavefront contacts the highest part of the, of the mirror, the next part, etc., and it bounces off. And notice what happened. Not only did we not correct the wavefront aberration, but it's actually double the amplitude we had before. That's clearly not the solution. Well, what happens if we try a, a deformable mirror with put in the same shape? as the aberrated waveform. Here we go, same thing again. Wavefront sensor senses the aberration, feeds that back to the deformable mirror. And now notice, as the wavefront contacts the mirror, every part of it contacts it together, reflects off simultaneously, and it still does not correct the wavefront. However, you might have noticed, if we had a flat mirror, that, sim that uh, gave us the same waveform and amplitude, but it inverted the same waveform uh, distortion gives us exactly the same distorted aberrated wavefront. Maybe what we want is kind of halfway in between. So let's try that. Here we have, again, the same thing, but this time the, uh, the mirror is going to take off half the amplitude same waveform, half the amplitude, and watch as it reflects off the bottom of the wave of the sort of wavefront, hits the lowest part of the mirror, reflects off as it passes the next lowest part of the uh, aberrated waveform, which passes up when it, the last part of the wavefront contacts that. And we reflect off, and congratulations, we just solved the problem. We recorrect, recreated, uh, restored the diffraction limit of the telescope. And we're done, right? Well, it, we have a few more details to go to. And it occurred to me that uh, several of you might think in rays and not wavefronts. So uh, let's uh, let's do the same thing. Let me demonstrate very, very quickly that I can we can come to exactly the same conclusion with rays. Here's another aberrated wavefront propagating down, down, down. And so uh, here we have the rays. What are rays? That they are just normal to the wavefront at every point across them. So an infinite part of uh, infinite number of rays that are just normal to the wavefront at that point. Now, if we put in an optical surface, a reflecting surface with the same shape, half the amplitude, let's take a look at uh, well one of these rays and see what happens. Um, okay, we have the ray coming in, and what we want is that ray to reflect right towards the vertical. So the normal needs to be, it needs to bisect that angle between the incident angle and the reflecting angle. So that is actually half the, uh, the angle between horizontal, where it's normal to the uh, vertical beam, and normal to the ray itself. If we went the other way to, again, to correct the beam, well, that ray shoots off to the side. That's not what we want. We appear to want half the angle. And if we apply that to every ray across there, every ray reflects up vertically. And again, for ray, we have a flat wavefront reflecting back up. So here we are back to our our cartoon of the um, of the adaptive optics system. 
Let's next take a look at this black box called the wavefront sensor and look under the hood there. Wavefront sensors can go by several types. There's the Shack Hartman array, pyramid, wavefront. But by far the most common and the only one I have direct experience, firsthand experience with is the Shack Hartman array. The Shack Hartman array is a 2D array of itty bitty little lenses. Lens lips. Now, uh, this image on the right here is an image of this would be only a 50 millimeter diameter or a 50 millimeter on side optic. And so you can see each of these itty bitty little lenses is on the order of a millimeter across, and very, very small. If you were to look at this without looking closely, you would just think it's a matte surface. But if we place the telescope pupil image on that 2D lenslet array, what we find is that each lenslet will image what that part of the telescope um, primary mirror or pupil is seeing. If each lenslet, the sub aperture, is at or less than your scene scale, that R naught I talked about earlier, then each image will be diffraction limited and identical, except for displacement due to tip of the wavefront at that point. Um, it's well illustrated over here by this cartoon. If you had a perfectly flat level um, wavefront coming in, the spot of a, uh, of a point source, a star, would appear in the same point behind each lens in that array. However, if you have a curved wavefront, that will be offset in uh, from the from the uh, flat wavefront some way, and uh, we'll show you the, um, the wavefront distortion. We can actually map out the wavefront distortion by taking into account the offsets in each sub aperture of the Shaq Hartman array. Here's an image of an actual Shaq Hartman array looking at a sunspot. You have to excuse me, my background is in solar astronomy, so most of my examples uh, that I've been able to steal, uh, collect, are uh, from the solar observatories I've been with. So this is, of course, from Big Bear Solar Observatory. And if you look through here, um, we have, you can notice that some of these sunspots, they're the same sunspot, but some of them will be displaced slightly in one sub aperture versus the other. Like this one looks a little low, this one maybe looks a little high and to the left. And that compared to a reference sub aperture, usually one around the center, uh, can use, be used to map out that wavefront distortion. What does a uh, wavefront sensor actually look like? Well, again, at Big Bear, this is it. It just looks like a bunch of optics in a stack, some lenses, and uh, I think the Shaq Hartman is actually, as I recall, in this holder here, which then forms the image on this high-speed CCD. Here's another example of a Shaq Hartman array. Um, this was a, the um, a frame grab from the Mercury transit across the solar disk in uh, November 11, 2019. And again, you can see the image of the of the planet Mercury in every sub aperture across that array, which is mapping out again the entire pupil of the telescope, the primary mirror. Here's a uh, zoom on the central portion of it. Here's a uh, the central sub-aperture used as a reference frame to which uh, each sub-aperture offset is then compared. You can see above this image looks a little off to the left, maybe, um, this one a little low. And so by comparing those, one can then map out and stitch together the overall wavefront distortion. Reconstruction, reconstructed wavefront is then fed back to the VM, which reconstructs and allows the 
diffraction limited image. And here's a frame grab of the image plane. Again, Mercury coming across the center, and you can see nicely how well the, uh, the solar granulation is resolved around it. And uh, to give you an idea, uh, adaptive optics really does work in real time. Here's another example, again, excuse me, BBSO, showing a movie, a fairly typical moderate to poor scene with, with natural scene, no adaptive optics. Switch on adaptive optics, and you can see the dramatic improvement. There is, at least most of the time, um, diffraction limited parts in each of those. Each one of these is actually a stack each frame is a stack of 100 frames, actually, um, through which the computer then uses a technique called speckle reconstruction to co in, co in uh, post-processing, choose the highest resolving point, point by point across the image and reconstruct this, which I hope a lot of you are saying, wow, right now. I still can get lost staring at these movies. So, how do we actually take that wavefront, which we put together from the Shaq Hartman array? It's uh, actually deconstructed by fitting it to a series of equations of ever increasing exponential order called modes. The number of modes, of course, has to be limited by the number of DM formal mirror actuators you actually have. Uh, one common polynomial series is called the Zernike polynomial series. And it's uh, used often because in this series, each polynomial describes an actual physical uh, aberration. Uh, here is an example of some of the lower order ones, of course, tip and tilt, the focus, astigmatism, coma, trefoil, quadrifoil, et cetera, et cetera, on up. And across the bottom, you can see that these are increasing order. You have first order here, a second order equation here, third order equation here, fourth order, et cetera. Now, before you panic, take a deep breath, and let's just make the equations go away. You don't have to know that, really. They just have to be looked up, and your computer has to know what those are to be able to fit each aberration order. Now, um, before we go on, I should probably point out that uh, to save on the amplitude of your deformal mirror, often tip tilt is often picked off separately to a separate just fast flat mirror to uh, take care of those and save the uh, amplitude of the deformal mirror for these higher order aberrations. Now, doing all this fitting to all these polynomials may seem like a roundabout complex way to um, be able to fit the, uh, the distortion of the wavefront to the, to the deformal mirror. But in reality, it's, um, it's efficient computationally. And if you think about it, the computer can take as much time as it wants to learn how to create each of these aberrations orders and um, store that in, as a matrix in memory. Then when it uh, fits the actual aberration mode, it just needs to know the amplitude of each order as a multiplicative uh, um, gain for each of those orders. And here I have yet another grossly oversimplified um, illustration to give you kind of a feel of the of what we're talking about. Here, imagine we're looking across the highly aberrated wavefront. This is just a slice through. In reality, we'd have to deal in two dimensions and not one dimension. But again, this is a spherical cow, so we'll cut this down to just one dimension and see what happens. Well, let's first of all just fit this to a first order equation, a simple linear fit. In other words, a line. And then mathematically take that out. Well, this is the residual. If we then fit that to a second order, the focus 
equation, then we can subtract that out. We could then fit that to a third order, subtract that out, and uh, you can see very, very quickly, you can run into a point of diminishing return as you go to higher orders. And the fourth order is, uh, even in this case, is very little decision. And even with uh, just doing these four modes, maybe we've already hit the diffraction limit of our, of our optical system. Maybe these little bumps are uh, smaller than a quarter wave, whatever, or they're smaller than uh, our, our um, sub-aperture, thus we can't do anything about that, whatever. But I think that gives you an idea. So how do we determine what that app, what this offset in each sub-aperture really is? Well, for point sources, it's fairly trivial. We just have to take the centroid and you're done, or like stars, or laser dark star, natural stars, things like that. However, um, for an extended object, again, like the sun, it's not quite as straightforward. Here's again a uh, Shaq Hartman array image that I snapped from uh, Big Bear, just showing quiet sun granulation. And uh, in the center, we have our, our, uh, our, our normal um, um, central sub aperture which we compare to each of the uh, ones around there. And uh, finding the, um, the best offset for each of those is maybe not as obvious as if it was a, a, a point source. So in a case like this, one needs to use a some cross correlation technique to actually determine what the best offset is. Now, there are many cross correlation techniques that have uh, terrifying names like Fourier and things like that. But there's at least one that is uh, quite intuitive that uh, I'll go over this evening called the sum of the absolute differences. Yes, sad. So uh, one more quick illustration. Now, imagine that we took that central reference frame and again, took just one cut, cut across the center and now instead of we're looking at the intensity of those pixels in that cut across that reference frame. Say uh, this pixel is an intensity four, five, five, eight, seven, et cetera, et cetera, across there. Then let's compare that to one of the arbitrary sub-apertures. And of course, keep in mind, we would have, we have to do this to each of all the sub-apertures in the Shaq Hartman array calculate what that is, feed that back to the DM, all before the sky has a chance to change the distortion on this. So here's a, an arbitrary sub-aperture frame. And uh, we compare that pixel by pixel in intensity and look at the difference. I'm not talking about subtracting one from the other. I mean the absolute difference. It's always a positive number, never a negative number. So here we have, say, a, a difference of one, here's a difference of two, zero, two. Over here, it's a difference of one, difference of two, two, et cetera. And we sum all those differences up and come up with a total. It looks like something like 35. Now we take that sub-aperture array and shift it one pixel and do the same thing. Sum up the differences pixel by pixel and we get some total, it looks like 24. Do that again, sum them up, we get a total of 21, I think. And then at the point where we shifted the, uh, the array far enough where they overlap, we get a minimum in that absolute difference. Continue on, oops, continue on. and uh, again, we have some difference. Continuing on, it gets worse and worse and worse. So by finding that minimum, we found how far we have to shift that sub-aperture array to get them to overlap. Now, of course, in an actual Shaq Hartman array, you would have to do this in two dimensions, rastering that across until those two images actually lined up and you got a minimum defined in two dimensions to minimum. But again, I think this demonstrates the concept well. 
Now, uh, finally, we have to calibrate the uh, deformable mirror. And how is that done? I talked about learning how to create those aberrations, all that. Well, if we place a pinhole in the uh, inside the system, a pinhole at an image plane ahead of the uh, deformable mirror, that pinhole aperture will define the image plane of the telescope. If the telescope doesn't actually focus on that, we will have to refocus the telescope to that point. That defines our image plane. It also creates essentially a perfect flat wavefront, a perfect image with a flat wavefront. Now, if we can assume that our deformable mirror is flat, maybe it's in um, the manufacturer told us it is, or we put it under an interferometer and looked at it, uh, we can assume that our DM is flat. Then by measuring any offsets in the um, irregularities in the sub, sub, uh, in the sub apertures, we can map out irregularities in the shack hartman array and tell the computer, okay, a flat wavefront, the position of that image is here, on this one here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then we need to determine what voltages are required to deform the DM to create uh, each of those aberration orders. Now that uh, sounds complicated and it sounds like it would take time to iterate and it probably does, but keep in mind, this is a calibration that does not need to be done in real time. You can take as long as you want and it only needs to be done once or at least very infrequently. So uh, you can even imagine the computer going through some technique to do that, or you can even imagine a bunch of people with mobs trying to iterate in on uh, getting that wavefront with the aberration of one. Now in the lower right, I have a, uh, a video, come on, art video, of a, uh, one of these very cheap aqua mirrors actually running through some of these aberration modes, trying to correct, create the coma, etc. cetera. So um, then all we really need to do is know how the, the relative voltage across the, uh, how much we need to deflect the DM for each actuator across the DM. And uh, we can create all the aberration modes we need to. Um, we still may probably need to um, calibrate each um, actuator. And uh, to do that, if it's, we can't necessarily assume that each one will have exactly the same displacement per unit voltage as the other. So uh, we can do that by actually running each individual actuator through its entire range and uh, coming up with a uh, displacement as a function of voltage and calibrate that. So how am I doing on time? Well, I still have a few minutes left. Great. How many sub lens slit sub apertures or DM actuators are actually necessary? Well, of course, that depends on your local R0. And it also depends, of course, on your telescope aperture. Uh, actuators need the number of needed goes up as the square of, the ap of your aperture, which you might expect. And uh, the good news is small telescopes don't need very many. As a matter of fact, if your aperture is at or smaller than your R0, all you'll have is uh, image motion. At each time, at each moment, that image will be diffraction limited. Thus, taking these very high speed images we amateurs do, we can get diffraction limited images of solar system objects, etc. Uh, in this illustration down I have on the lower left, imagine that our scene, you know, for my example, I say, let's have a scene of one arc seven, which is pretty good, at least for my backyard. Um, again, I'm going to assume, I'm going to call the middle of the visible 500 nanometers. And so your R naught, that scene scale we can calculate is 
125 millimeters or about five inches. So if this is uh, your R naught diameter and you have a five inch telescope, you are diffraction limited on the sky. You are not seen limited. What happens, however, if you go wild and buy a 15 inch telescope, which is three R naught across? Well, you would need nine sub apertures and uh, actually double that number of actuators because each sub for each sub aperture you would need to be able to tip and tilt. And so of course as your aperture goes up, here I have uh, half the actuators as a function of aperture in inches. You can see it goes up fairly quickly. But um, if you stay down and have a fairly good scene, you can get by without adaptive optics. Also, if you don't hold your wavelength steady, uh, longer wavelengths, well, your resolution is lower. And seeing is actually physically better at longer wavelengths, which results in a larger R naught, making adaptive optics simple. Now, you may ask, what I have seen better at longer wavelengths? Well, of course, first of all, you have Again, the Rayleigh -like, -like criteria showing that if you double your wavelength, that uh, diffraction limited angle will double. So, uh, but at the same time, you have re refraction decreases with wavelength. And uh, this is known as dispersion. It's why prisms work and why Scott has to sell really expensive telescopes with a bunch of optics in it to take, uh, take this out. It is uh, well illustrated here by, uh, by the eminent professor Pink Floyd, showing that uh, blue light is refracted more strongly than red light, et cetera. So as you go to longer wavelengths, the uh, refraction, the deviation of light through our atmosphere decreases with wavelength. And so um, the R naught scales a little more than you would expect, a little more than, uh, than linear. It's actually scales like with by something like uh, wavelength to the six fifth power. So if you double your wavelength, instead of doubling your R naught, you actually end up with something more like 2.3 R naught, making, of course, fewer sub apertures you need and um, fewer actuators. And actually you can, uh, you can refresh more slowly the corrections. How fast must these corrections be made? Well, it depends on not only your R0 and your telescope aperture, but also on like, things like wind. How fast is that distorting medium moving across your field of view? And uh, that's something that really has to be found um, by measuring the site and can change moment to moment, but uh, essentially it must be fast enough to beat the sky faster than the sky has a chance to change. Rule of thumb is something in the kilohertz range. One few kilohertz, you have a very large aperture. You know, uh, these giant telescopes are going to need, need to be significantly faster than that. Now, limitations, important. The maximum correction amplitude is limited by the stroke of your DM. If you have such bad seeing that the wavefront distortion is larger than the, um, the deformable mirror can actually correct for, you cannot fully correct. Intuitively obvious. That doesn't mean it doesn't help. It would still improve, but you will not be able to get to the full performance that the uh, adaptive optics system is uh, designed to do, hopefully you diffraction limit. And this is a very important point. The wavefront correction is, is uh, measured for one point and one point on the sky only. So, as you move away from that point, your correction will apply less and less. 
over off the side of your field of view, you're coming through a different part of the sky that has a different wavefront aberration. And so what you'll find is that the corrected area falls off pretty quickly. Now the region over which, the angle over which you can say you're fully corrected goes by the uh, cool name of isoplanatic angle. Now iso meaning same, plane, planatic meaning flat. It's the angle over which you can assume that wavefront is flat. So while uh, yes, ground-based AO systems can create images to the diffraction limit matching those of a space telescope, unfortunately it's over a very small field of view. And that can be even only say a few arc seconds across. It's a very important concept there. And also the number of sub as we said, and VM actuators increases as the square of the aperture. Uh, you can only fully correct the diffraction limit if your sub apertures are effectively smaller than the scenes that, that are not. Now, um, again, those corrections, the measurements of the wavefront correction, uh, wavefront sensor has to be done very, very quickly. And so one needs bright guide stars to uh, be able to take those reference frames fast enough to keep up. And bright guide stars are pretty rare, creating the need for artificial laser guide stars. Uh, there are two types of laser guide star, uh, a sodium laser, which uses a uh, a laser at uh, 5892 angstroms in the yellow. Uh, it's used to excite the um, orbital of sodium atoms up at the very top of the atmosphere, about 90 kilometers up. It's a thin layer, about five kilometers thick. So what you get is a nice, fairly round artificial guide star at the top of the atmosphere, showing you the uh, influence of seeing through the entire atmosphere. The other type of laser is just called a Rayleigh beacon. It scatters off molecules, mostly in the lower atmosphere. Think of uh, those laser pointers none of us should be using at star parties that uh, as they shine up, it's just scattering off of particulate in the atmosphere, showing you the beam as it goes up. Uh, for Rayleigh beacons, various wavelengths can be used. So if you're trying to measure the sodium line, this allows you to go to some other wavelength and filter it out of your image. Um, however, it's not limited to a thin layer at the top of the atmosphere. It uh, doesn't sample the atmosphere evenly as it goes up. So it is inferior in that regard, but it is simpler and cheaper to build. But the takeaway, just remember, if it ain't yellow, it ain't sodium. Let's move on. Now, finally, things to come. What's, the, uh, what's on the horizon for us? Um, I keep talking about that uh, R0, that isoplanatic patch that is the area over which a uh, AO can correct for. Um, there is a new technique being developed at numerous large telescopes called multi-conjugate adaptive optics. Um, MCAO, what it does is it uses multiple deformal mirrors, which are correcting for various altitudes in the atmosphere, correcting for those independently. What that does is it doesn't improve the image correction, it makes that applicable over a wider field. Now here we have a, an image of what we call classic now AO. Then you see if you switch on multiple deformable mirrors correctly for these different elevations, you get a wider isoplanatic angle. Let's see that one more time just because it's a really cool video. Here, yes, you're getting very nice correction in the center, but only over a few, maybe five arc seconds, switch on multiple multi-conjugate adaptive optics, and you can see that broadens out to maybe 30, 35 arc seconds. Well, unfortunately, just a couple of weeks ago, a paper appeared, dropped on me. I came to my attention because I happened to know one of the authors. 
talking about a, an idea to use predictive algorithms to decrease the correlation lag. Um, in a nutshell, think about, well, if your wavefront is changing in some way, well, an instant later, it's probably going to be further in that direction. If you can come up with an algorithm that can uh, anticipate what the, uh, what the next correction will be, maybe you can uh, improve and decrease the lag in your, uh, in your correction, which would improve your ultimate correction time. And finally, I know you're all, I know you're all asking, uh, when can I get one of these for my uh, backyard C8? And uh, well, actually uh, think about it. I keep talking about that R not in uh, your backyard. I don't know, but uh, in my backyard, probably an eight inch telescope is probably already pretty well matched to my scene under good skies. So uh, tip tilt systems from like uh, um, SDIG are, are, are already available and effective. Some high order systems are still pretty expensive and difficult to use for the, the amount of improvement they would probably give. But uh, a few have been made, but uh, I don't really expect to see those on the shelves. I don't know, Scott, maybe you have something you're going to announce <laughs> coming out, but uh, I don't really expect that to become a um, something that we're going to be rushing out and buying anytime soon. But who knows, as amateurs push the limit, uh, start getting these extremely large, um, really professional observatories, uh, running them remotely, etc. Who knows? So thank you very much. I just ran barely over an hour, so I think I did pretty well. And uh, if there is time, um, I'm happy to take questions if I can answer them. And uh, while we wait, I'll leave you with a vocabulary list that you can uh, impress your friends at dinner parties with. So thank you very much. Thank you, Claude. You answered my question. I'm sitting here thinking, when can I get that in my backyard? <laughs> I would, oh, after looking at what, what it can do, it's, oh, it's amazing. Yeah, however, think about the fact that uh, um, the lucky imaging people are doing with their uh, backyard scopes are getting the uh, diffraction limit and just disregarding the uh, time when it's not dis um, not diffraction limited and producing some mind-bogglingly clear images of bright objects like the planets. And so I think that is the direction we're going. For deep sky, well, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Scott, do you have any questions? Yeah, when can I get one? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's mine too. That's my question. No, That's you know, there was mind. comments, um, you know, uh, people, uh, uh, amateur astronomers are wondering, you know, when in the future they might have access to space telescopes, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, that may happen at one point. Uh, you know, with space tourism and stuff, if there's a hotel on the moon, why, why not uh, a telescope that you can rent, uh, you know, at the Hilton there somewhere on the dark side of the moon? I don't know. So a few years ago, I would have said, uh, no way um, that the rule of thumb that I talked about three orders of magnitude still holds. Yeah. But uh, watching what SpaceX and the others are doing, who knows if they can make a breakthrough right. if that starship flies? Um, they may have a lot of extra baggage to uh, send up. And Elon Musk uh, may make uh, some kind of uh, reparations for what he's doing to our night nice sky. So who knows? Maybe, <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe it will right. become available in not too many years to us. That's right. <laughs> yes, but it was a, it was fascinating, and and uh, uh, thank you, Claude. That was a very thorough uh, explanation of adaptive optics, much much more thorough than than I had uh, experienced when I saw the the adaptive to. optics turned on at the hundred inch way you know, <laughs> years ago. So, yeah. But, um, well, 
Okay, thank you, Scott. Any other questions or do we need to move on? Uh, no more questions, I don't think, okay. unless there's some from, uh, from our group. Oh, that either means that I answered every question or I've lost everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I have heard that with every equation you show, you lose. Okay, here's a question. <laughs> here's a question. Okay. James Fullerton, who's watching on Facebook, he says the AL computer probably would not draw much power, but what about the actuators? Um, again, that depends on the, uh, on the type and the size. Um, something like this, uh, the current is mm -hmm. um, minuscule. Uh, however, yes, you do typically need a, a rack of amplifiers, but it's nothing that can't be handled with a, a fair rack power supply. We, I can't give you a number that uh, the Zenetics system we used uh, actually took, but it did take a, uh, it took a rack of amplifiers for each, each piezo. Something like um, I showed on the number two mirror of the large binocular telescope using uh, voice coil solenoids. That will take more current to hold, but it's really in a function of the inertia of that mirror and how thin that mirror needs to be. I see. And I what see. you Which certainly, don't want, to do, what you certainly don't want to do is dissipate enough heat to where you're heating up the optic itself. Just to, you don't want your AO system destroying your scene. <clears throat> That's right. Yeah, it's a very uh, tenuous type of thing. Excellent. Cla Thanks. Thank you, Claude. That was awesome. Yes, thank, thank you very much. That is really amazing. Okay. I appreciate that. Uh, I am. We have many, many viewers watching this. Um, I am going to, Claude, can I get you to stop sharing so I can bring up the answers to the questions? We have a lot of answers on these questions. So we have a pretty good audience out there watching right now. Um, good. Scott, do you need to- Yeah, I'll help you. I'll help you. Um, oh, stop sharing. There it is. There we go. <laughs> you got it. Thank you again. Thank you, and I, I want to I thank Claude uh, for a moment here. Claude uh, was on some of my very early um, uh, programs where I was trying to learn how to do broadcasting and stuff. And he and his and his wife, Teresa, uh, did some special programs uh, for us from the Big Bear Solar Observatory, which was totally cool, you know, and um, yeah, so it was it was wonderful. And I appreciate that, Claude. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate that. And uh, Teresa does as well. So yeah, thanks again. <laughs> it sounds amazing. All right, I'm going to go back and give the answers for the questions. So, uh, whoops, let me do this. <clears throat> On the first question, um, if you do not have a go-to telescope, name another way to find objects in the sky, which setting circles, star hopping, Matt Penn answered that question correctly. Next question. The name of this object, I tried to find a picture that maybe wasn't quite nor up to it. <laughs> there she <laughs> is. Congratulations, Teresa. Uh, is yeah. it Bifford? Yes. Climate. Yes. <laughs> Matt Penn happens to be a good friend of ours, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I actually lived for Matt good. back at the McMath Bridge Telescope. So congratulations, Matt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, and congratulations, Teresa. Like I said, we have a lot of people out here watching right now. And the last question, what observatory houses the largest refracting telescope ever built for astronomical research? Naturally, Yerkes. Uh, and Alan Mason answered that correctly. So thank you to all three of our winners. Carol or somebody from the national office will be contacting you. Yeah, we'll be watching for that Astronomical League hat on one or both of you. <laughs> All right. Um, before I wrap up, uh, Carol, David, anybody want to say any final words? I'd just like to say it's a, another outstanding presentation. And uh, we thank you again, Claude, for uh, spending a Big chunk of your evening to uh, enlighten us on adaptive optics. So, very appreciative. 
And it was so good to see you, Claude. I miss you from when you were at the TAAA meetings and Teresa. And uh, it's been a long time, and it was good to see you in action one more time. Well, thank you very much. Hopefully, uh, once the pandemic eases up a bit, we uh, now I'm retired, I hope to be able to get out and attend finally some more conferences, star parties, that sort of thing. Oh, and we had to open our big mouths here in Bear Valley Springs about astronomy. We're starting an official club and we already have a list of uh -oh. 60 people. Yeah. <laughs> <Very great. laughs> here we go again. Yeah, again. all right. All right. That's great. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Astro Astronomical League Live 10 will be back October 15th at 7 p.m. EDT. So please join us then. And thank you everybody for joining us. And uh, please join us then. We look forward to seeing everybody. That's right. Keep looking up, everybody, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, and we'll see you back on uh, on Monday with uh, Dr. Daniel Barth on How Do You Know. Take care and have a great weekend. Bye -bye. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Do you know what time it is? Looks like it's time to go back to school. Hi everyone, my name is Matthias Maurer and I'm busy training for my upcoming mission to the International Space Station. This September, ESA Education goes back to school with five school projects for primary and secondary school students. Let's have a look at them. In the European Astropi Challenge, you'll have the chance to conduct your own specific experiment in space by writing a computer program that will run on the Raspberry Pi computers on board with me on the International Space Station. Never coded before? No problem! You can get started with Mission Zero, an entry-level challenge for beginners. This year, you will have the special mission of naming the new Astropies. Mission Space Lab, on the other hand, will open the door to a whole new world of experiment possibilities, thanks to the new sensors and cameras. We astronauts on the International Space Station have a unique and amazing perspective of our planet. Seeing Earth from space reminds us how important our planet is and that we must protect it. The Climate Detectives Project is our chance to help ESA understand and protect our planet's environment. You'll be challenged to make a difference by investigating a local climate problem using real satellite data and your own measurements. In the end, you share your results with the Climate Detectives community as a real scientist. Next up is Moon Camp. Accept the challenge to 3D design a habitat on the lunar surface. Develop experiments to explore the extreme environment of the Moon and understand how astronauts could live there. And then use your knowledge to design your very own 3D Moon Camp using Tinkercad or Fusion 360. Don't forget to adapt your design to the Moon environment. Consider the use of local resources and provide protection of living and working facilities for the astronauts. This challenge is open to beginners and advanced participants. Choose between three categories featuring different levels of complexity. The Moon Camp Discovery, Moon Camp Explorers, and Moon Camp Pioneers. With CANSAT, you'll imagine, build and test your very own mini satellite fitting the size of a soda can. Then your CANSAT will be launched by a small rocket up to an altitude of one kilometer, where it can complete its scientific mission. A primary mission will consist of measuring temperature and pressure, and a secondary mission that is up to your own imagination. If you're completely new, the CANSAT Beginners Challenge will allow you to understand the basics of CANSAT by measuring temperature using Tinkercad circuits. 
Last but not least, there's Mission X, where you are there to get up, move your body and train like an astronaut. You complete fun science and physical activities to develop your fitness skills and explore how real astronauts train for missions to space, from what we eat to how we keep our muscles and bones healthy. Earn points for each activity you complete to help the Mission X mascots, Luna and Leo, walk to the moon. For teachers who are curious to discover more about space, ESA is also running online teacher trainings during the school year. The workshops will explore how space technology and the study of our home planet from above can be used in the classroom in an inspiring and innovative way. You can find information about all the school projects and teacher trainings and how to take part at the link below. I'll be following your progress all the way from the ISS. Time to pack your bags and to head back to school. Thank you. 